Romans chapter 3, verses 1 through 8, reads as this. It says, Then what advantage has the Jew, or what is the value of circumcision? Much in every way. To begin, to begin with, the Jews were entrusted with the oracles of God. What if some were unfaithful? Does their faithfulness nullify the faithfulness of God? By not, let God be true, though everyone were a liar, as it is written, that you may be justified in your words and prevail when you are judged. But if our unrighteousness serves to show the righteousness of God, what shall we say? That God is unrighteous to inflict wrath on us? I speak in a human way. By no means. For then how could God judge the world? But if through my lie God's truth abounds to his glory, why am I still being condemned as a sinner? And why not do evil that good may come? As some people slanderously charge us with saying, their, ju- their condemnation is just. Uh, praise be to God for the reading of Missouri. You all can go ahead and have a seat. Faithfulness presents itself in many ways. We've been seeing the themes about faithfulness kind of persist throughout the, the narrative of the book of Romans as Paul is communicating the story of the Christian faith. But this idea, though, about being faithful is is one where we hope that people will catch a vision of faithfulness that is one without reservation, even. Without the the questioning of whether or not you can truly remain faithful when there's opposition, obstacles, hurdles in life. If I could just briefly just talk about it for a moment in a a more uh, delightful way for some would be some of y'all are faithful sports fans. Uh, some of y'all know this because y'all been fans for teams for a long time, and they haven't gotten any results. It's, it's been a drought. Uh, maybe that's you, you're a Commanders fan if it's in football. Maybe you are a Cowboys fan who lives in the glory days of the 90s, and you can't get past it um, because every year your team just lets you down. I mean, maybe that's you. Um, but you're faithful, right? You're faithful. Uh, there's some others out here that are more in the bandwagon type of category. Uh, Maybe that was you. You started rooting for the Patriots for a season, but now that Brady's gone, you don't even talk about them anymore. Maybe you're like somebody I talked to recently. It was a student, and they were telling me about their favorite basketball team. And they're like, man, I've been a Warriors fan for a long time. And I was like, oh, man, so so you know all about the Warriors. So you're talking about, like, a friend when, like, Baron Davis, Jason Richardson was playing. This is, like, early 2000s. They're like, I'm not that old. I've, I've just been a fan since 2015. I was like, oh, since they've been good. They're like, oh, yeah, I'm a true fan. Faithfulness without reservation. Uh, It shows itself in different ways in life. And as we think about the Christian faith, our hope is this, is that our faithfulness in God would be one that is immovable, one that is persistent, one that is consistent. This is something that Paul talked about in this text as he's working through these ideas here. If you would meet me in verses 1 and 2, then what advantage has the Jew? What is the value of circumcision? Much in every way, to begin with, the Jews were entrusted with the oracles of God. You might wonder, what is he talking about here? He's going back to this idea of, do they have an advantage? The past few weeks, we've seen this kind of come into the fuller focus that there was a separation between um, the, the Jewish people and the Gentile people and how they viewed themselves and their relationship with God. And, and the question was at this time was, well, for the Roman Christians, did the Jewish community actually have an advantage when, in their relationship with God over the Gentiles? And, and Paul addresses this straight up. Because as he talks about their relationship and their ability to not even measure up at times, he even poses the question, does this even nullify the works of God in their lives? Does it even nullify their relationship with God even though they have been unfaithful at times? He even talks about this. Can there even be an advantage when their circumcision is nullified? I was talked about in last week's sermon. I'll give you an encouragement to go back and listen to that idea. See, in the Jewish community, Paul communicates that they had a sense of an advantage. But what was their advantage? Here's the advantage. It, it wasn't that they were circumcised. It wasn't that they had been perfect in obedience to the law. But the advantage that they had was that God had revealed himself to all of creation, but even particularly to them 
He showed himself to him through his self-revelation. And this is important for us to understand that God's self-revelation is a grace to us. That God in his, his mercy and his kindness has revealed himself to the world. Deuteronomy chapter 4 verse 8 helps us to understand this idea. And it will bring clarity to the theme for this morning's sermon, Faithful Without Reservation. What other nation is so great as to have such righteous decrees and laws as this body of laws that I am setting before you today? This is God speaking to them about what he has given them, how he has revealed himself to them, the statutes and the laws so that they would follow after him, that God had revealed himself in a very particularized way with a hope and a desire that they would respond to it. This is what I want us to get this morning from this text, is that God's self-revelation shows his faithfulness. It shows it to us that, that before you were faithful, God was faithful. Law Israel, they would see who he is and that they would walk with him. One in for clarity, and that verse 2 helps to bring that idea into clarity for you, because it says they were given the oracles of God. The, the oracle said that he had showed himself in such a way, and he puts a matter of importance on it. So not only does God show up and reveal himself to humanity, but for Israel, for those who have received or responded to this special revelation, they've been given these oracles, and, he, and the text says they've been entrusted with it. So not only is it that God shows himself to you, but he gives you a sense of priority in the sense of you need to actually guard the deposit that which has been given to you, that you should respond well to God revealing himself in your life. See, God revealed himself with a purpose. The, the hope was that you would actually be changed. And I think this is important for people who have ideas or understandings of cultural Christianity or, or people who will say, well, you know, I know about Jesus. I, I, I've heard about him. I would even say that I would have a high regard for his word. But, but what Paul is getting at here is that they had been entrusted with what has been revealed to them. The entrusting takes a, a sense of personal responsibility in your own lives to respond in faith. It's like you've been given something very precious in your family. It's been handed down, right? You, you're entrusted with it. You want to keep it tight. You, you don't want anything to happen with it that God has revealed himself to you so that you would know who he is. And he wants you to actually Respond in faith. See, central to God's nature is his communicative attribute of his goodness. And in light of his goodness, he desires to show himself to the world through natural revelation, but also to his people through special revelation. We talked about this earlier in Romans chapter 1, going into chapter 2, about this idea of natural revelation being for the nations and everybody being able to see how God has revealed himself. Now here, Paul is shifting the attention to the, the Israelites and those who had come into contact with the revelation of God. So it's not to be handled in the same manner, but it's different when God has showed himself to you in this way. He was seeking to prompt faithfulness in their camp. See, it's in these moments that God even shows his worth to you before you even have the chance to show your response. And I think this is a, kind of a prerequisite for your understanding of faith, that, that God was first faithful to you before you could be faithful. That in your understanding of him even showing himself to you, it proves that he is a, a God who comes near, a God who desires for you to have movement in your life, for you to experience the richness of life with him. So this sets a foundational understanding for us because it establishes that he is indeed trustworthy, good, and just. See, our starting point for the Christian faith should flow from the faithfulness of God. It doesn't start with your faith toward God. It, it doesn't start with your decision to start following Jesus, but it starts with his great pursuit of us and how he has created the world and how he has showed himself to us. See, this can actually turn upside down your, your posture of who God is because many of us come to the Christian faith making it, you know, so, so much about us. Maybe even today you might feel that same temptation that um, you want God to show himself faithful to you today. 
Therefore, then you will walk out the life that God is calling you to. That you're, you're hoping that he will just miraculously do something in your heart to change you today because you felt a sense of complacency. You want God to, to prove to you that he is worth following time and time again. Many of us have built our lives of faith that way. When, when God responds to us faithfully, then we will act in faith to God. God, if you just make it clear for me, then, then I will give everything that I can for you because then I'll know you're good. Again, this turns us upside down because God has been good through his revelation of himself, and that is a state of fact and foundation for the life of faith of a Christian. But see, Paul here begins to reinforce God's faithfulness regardless of humanity's response to God. This is another idea that's important for us because humanity tends to base our affection for God's faithfulness based on our interpretation of his revelation. Whether or not we deem his revelation good for us, whether or not we deem his revelation appropriate for us in this moment, whether we deem his revelation applicable to our lives in this moment, we allow that to determine whether or not we actually see him as good, trustworthy, and just. Well, the God that I know, he would, he would never communicate justice like that. The, the, the God that I, that I love and I serve, he, he would never reveal himself in this way. This is uh, oftentimes phrases that people use when they come into contact with how God has revealed himself to his people. Because there's this temptation within our to begin to understand our own understanding of God through our own prism of our own eyes. That we begin to determine his faithfulness to us based on our vision and understanding of what it means to be faithful. Then we'll begin to determine our merits of faithfulness based on how we believe that he should think of us as being faithful. But it's important for us to remember that it's God who, who deems what is faithful. It's not for us. It's not for you to set the standard of faithfulness in your home, in your workplace, in the church, but, but God sets the standards for what it means to be faithful. And it's not to us to create within our own minds, even though we've been given this beautiful imagination, what God's faithfulness looks like. So for Israel, this, this God had revealed himself to them. And in contemporary terms, of Jesus today that God has showed himself to us. We know clearly through the incarnation of the son Jesus and through his word that communicates who he is. He's revealed himself to us and he too has trusted you with the oracles of God. And God hopes and anticipates for us to respond to who he is. But will you respond? How will his faithfulness Bring about faithfulness in your life. How has his revelation encouraged you to give more of yourself to him for his glory? Second observation from the text this morning I just want to talk about is that our faithfulness never changes his faithfulness. And I think this is important for us to understand. Because if we go back to begin to linger with Paul's argument that he makes here, he talks about the advantage that the Jews might have. But then the next question is, in verse 3, well, what if some were unfaithful? What, what if you've been revealed to of who God is, but then you are unfaithful to him? Maybe that's like you today. Maybe you grew up in church your whole life. You've heard all the stories for a long time. Hey, maybe you've been going to church for the past few months, and you think about, man, I, I've known and I've heard about Jesus, but I, I don't know if I've actually been faithful to Jesus. Well, what does this mean for me? Well, Paul is talking about this similar idea here. He's even talking about it for Israel, for those who, again, had come into contact but had not truly trusted in his word and walked with him. What happens to those who receive God's revelation but live without regard of his faithfulness? This is important because as we begin to think about how God establishes his faithfulness to us is that he reveals and he desires relationship. Now, many times when you think about relationships, um, you should think about them as a two-way street, right? 
uh, one of the, the beautiful elements about who God is is that um, despite us, our mistakes, our strife, our issues, our resistance towards him, he pursues us in relationship. That even him opening his heart, revealing himself to us, him showing characteristics of himself to you and I is God revealing himself to you. It's him initiating. But one thing I talk about with people all the time is that people get very frustrated with one-way street relationships, right? Man, I've been really trying to give so much in that relationship, really trying to pour into these people, but I don't know if I've reciprocated much back. That, and so you, you think about that idea, but, but this is what God is, is talking to us about in this text. That God has showed himself so much to Israel, but Israel was choosing themselves over God. They were, in fact, choosing the creation over the creator. They were choosing the idols of the other culture. So this is challenging this idea here. But something pastorally that is interesting to me is that it's oftentimes people that complain about one-way relationships at times are people that participate in creating one-way relationships. That, That they're just waiting for somebody to do more for them so that they can then be faithful to the relationship. And this is how we treat God at times, that that we just want God to show himself time and time again, and then you'll start taking God's relationship serious. But in this moment, we need to really think about this idea because within our own hearts, we have to deal with this own temptation to turn from God. Because we often are this greater offender. He's pursuing you wholeheartedly, but are you receptive to his pursuit? If I could use the phone analogy, uh, you know, do you even pick up the phone with them? Do, do you even talk with them, spend time with them, seek to respond to his faithfulness? Do you even just pause and say, thank you for being faithful first to me today, despite even knowing today I might be faithless at times. I might be unfaithful to you. But you still showed yourself faithful to me each and every day. And I think this is important for the Christian life. Because the relationship that we can establish with God is not built on the same type of relational capital that we act with today in society. We act as if people have to prove their worth to us in many ways before we'll begin to respond to them in faith. But God's different. One, um, God doesn't make you prove your worth before he responds to you. Um, The second element of it is that God actually can prove his worth, not like everybody else, because he has established himself faithful to us. But it's up to us to respond in a life of faith. I don't know where you're at this morning. I I don't know if you believe that God hasn't really been intentionally pursuing you, or if you have turned from him in certain ways, or struggling to walk with him, but I want to encourage you to know that, that he is indeed faithful to you. See, Paul finds importance in making sure that humanity faithlessness doesn't nullify God's faithfulness. Because if God himself is established as faithful before the foundation of the world, there's no human action that can earth his faithfulness. I think that's important. Because some of you right now are beating up on yourselves because you feel like you've done so much that you can't even walk back into this relationship with God. You feel like you can't actually come to him with your sin and with your issues. Um, some of you might feel that, that weight and tension that he can't be to you because you've lacked faith in your life. See, that's not how the Christian faith works. See, Israel was turning away from God and pursuing their own selfishness, but that didn't change anything about God's nature. You can be as greedy as you want to, but it doesn't change God's love for you and him showing himself up um, to be involved in your life. See, if God's nature is unchanging and his faithfulness abounding, then he indeed is trustworthy. And then he indeed can be someone whom you can give authority to in your life. It's a reminder that, that God is not wishy-washy, right? God's not like people who sometimes fail you, sometimes make mistakes, and you don't know which person you're going to get. Are they going to be dependable or not? Some of y'all have a a big issue with undependable people, right? It really irks your nerves a lot when they don't show up when they say they're going to and and do what they say, and 
Uh, you're, you're really quick to want to just push them to the side and I'll find somebody else or oh, the adage is I'll just do it myself. But many times we don't see ourselves as that type of person before God. That we're not always there. We're not always being faithful to the relationship. Yet he still pursues us. See, here's our application here, that our lack of faith in God won't change his faithfulness. God works outside of the human economy of relationship. We tend to change our response to others based on their faithfulness to us. And if an individual is unfaithful to us, we are more likely to be unfaithful to them. Is that you right now? Are there people in your life that you begin to give up on? Are there people that you actually are not meeting with the love of Christ? You're not emulating Jesus in the way he pursues people, but you've had enough? And you're holding them to higher standards than you even hold yourself to? Are you willing to even to evaluate your own heart today and to, to determine whether or not that is you? As we think about this, and we turn our back time and time again, it's, it's so encouraging for us to remember that your sin cannot nullify the faithfulness of God. And let me say it this way, that some of us believe that we actually have that much power. Like, you use that in relationships, right? You wield your power and authority to, like, maneuver relationships for your own gain, for your own greed. You want to impact rooms in that way. Um, in the way that you speak life or speak death in, in, in the people where you talk to them, you either encourage them or you discourage them. But some of us have related in that type of relational economy in that type of way of others. And you believe that to be true about God. But, but here's the thing, though, that you don't have that much power to actually change his faithfulness. That you can't stop him from loving you perfectly. Stop loving you perfectly. You're, I'm talking about your earthly father. But that, that's not God. Maybe it's your mother. You felt like you struggled in that relationship most of your life. Maybe it's your friends. Here's the reality. Like, they are not God. But many times we read on to God our own standards of what it means to be faithful in this world on him. And we treat him in the same way we treat everybody else. See, it should be the inverse. It should be the way that you understand God and his faithfulness and how it anchors your life should be the way that it shapes you and how you respond to relationships, and how you pursue others with grace time and time again. See, this is what the writer wants the readers to understand, that Israel's unfaithfulness did not have that much power. But it's interesting, though, because as you journey through the text, and he says, by no means, he says, let God be true, though, even, I mean, though everyone were a liar. Let God be true, though everyone were a liar. As it is written, that you may be justified in your words and prevail when you are judged. How, how would it feel for, you know, God to call you a liar? When you think about this for a moment, that, like, God would respond in this way to Israel's unfaithfulness and would say, real soft fam, like, just stop lying about it. Stop acting like you're me. Stop acting like you're fully obedient and that you're, you're seeking after life of faith. But why don't you actually start by st stopping the lying and beginning the life that I, that I want for you? And this is interesting here because the question of nullify the law is not of question because they weren't actually walking with Yahweh. That God had revealed himself to Israel, but, but many of them were not actually walking with him. This is why it does not nullify the law. They claimed to be receptive to the word of God. But they were just simply deceiving themselves into cultural pragmatism. Just doing what is right to be given off the sense of uh, esteem that you are doing what is Christian in the world. Is that you today? Maybe your heart has been so far away from God that you just want people to practically think you're Christian. And honestly, within your heart, you're, you're lying about it. 
someone asks you, man, how's your time with the Lord been? Man, it's been great, man. I've been growing a lot. Man, you haven't grown an inch. But, but it's aesthetic. We, we like talking about it in that way. We like posturing ourselves as if we, if we have suffered much growth in our lives instead of being honest with ourselves. See, the beginning for some of us in taking steps of faith in our lives begins with the honesty about where you're actually at. And honesty is freedom in that for you. Because when you begin to be honest, you'll open yourselves up more to God doing something transformative in your life. And for some of us, we've been in this perpetual habit of lying about the state of our faith. But God already sees that we're liars. That you may be justified in your words and prevail when you are judged. This is what this means, that you will tell others in your words that you're good, that you're walking well with the Lord, hoping that you will escape judgment in the end based on your performance here through your actions and your words. But when God sees through it, you will still stand before him one day. And so many of us fight this tension in our lives trying to perform for others. Let me say this. Some of us live a life where you just want to give off a sense of performance for God. But it's not for God. It's for others so that they think that you're deeply rooted in God. You're a puppet for man. You're not living for the glory of God. And I think that's really important for us. Because some of us have been playing for everybody else for so long. We haven't felt something in a long time or if at all. It's based on performance. I don't know where it comes from for you. Maybe it's from the sense of acceptance that you've been desiring for much of your life. I don't know if it's like the, the young athlete who just wants their coach to tell them that they did well on the move so they can get that affirmation. I, I don't know what it is for you in your life, but that temptation to want to perform is within all of us. It's all about the image. But God sees it. This is where Paul transitions to inferring about the justice of God and holding Israel accountable for their sins. But if our unrighteousness serves to show the righteousness of God, what shall we say? That God is unrighteous to inflict wrath on us? I speak in a human way. See, God isn't unrighteous for inflicting his wrath on anybody. And that, even that idea some of us struggle with, maybe in here right now as I say that, like, that God would actually hold people accountable for their sins. And that even as I rehearsed a few moments earlier, you say, well, that's not a good God if he actually holds people accountable in that way. And when I, when I talk about this idea with people sometimes, um, most people are not ultimately honest because when something bad happens in this world, um, you're probably the same person who's really quick to want justice to be served to somebody who commits something heinous, right? You're like, man, they need to, they need to be held accountable. You're quick to want that, right? But when it comes to God and how he moves with people and someone who's extended much grace, who has been faithful, he's revealed himself through natural revelation, but also through special revelation that Eventually, God holds those accountable who don't walk with him. We question his justness. See, God in his perfect timing extends grace. Sometimes people wonder about, in the post-fall reality, why didn't God just fix it right there? Um, But in many ways, God desires in his good nature for many people come to walk with him. And his expansion of time is his hope and his desire that, that more people repent and trust him in faith. God is good in his nature in desiring that reality. It's interesting because the text picks up on our human understanding of God calling, I mean, of, of calling something God does unjust. It's interesting because This is a very common human occurrence to raise these questions, and and Paul is is taking us straight to that question. And as we think about God being just in judging them, it's a reminder that God has the power and the authority over the world. This is important for us because if we can't see his power and his authority, it will impact actually how you walk with Jesus. Let me explain this. Because some of us struggle with the idea that the triune God has this much power and authority, but then you say you want to be a disciple of Jesus. 
Well, even in the Great Commission, if you notice in it, most of us talk about the go, therefore, made disciples of the nations. But what happens before that? Jesus says, all power and authority under heaven and on earth have been given to me. Therefore, go. It's the assumption in that the, 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 the static nature of who he is and his faithfulness even proves to us who he is, but also that he actually has the authority and the power over our lives to call us into a life as a disciple. I think this is important for us as we understand his faithfulness and respond to him because we need to rightly appropriate his authority and his power in, so that we can walk faithfully with him. See, the Christian life will be a life of much tension for you if you don't rightly see his authority and power. If you don't at some point come to terms with it. Because if not, you're just going to go through the power struggle. And here's the reality of the power struggle. There's, there's been people that, in quote unquote, want to wrestle with God in life, right? But, but here's the reality. Um, I don't know if anybody's beat them. You might think you bad. You might think like you're tough, like it's a God, you're giving left hook, you're giving the right hook to God, as if you have that much power. Again, we have this much power and authority in our minds. Yeah, I'm showing you now. Can't outsmart them. Outrun them. Uh, this goes back to the garden narrative, right? Adam and Eve thought they could hide. Outwit. Jonah thought he could just get into the ocean, hop off a boat. God caught him. See, we need to come to the right understanding of who he is. And when we can do that, it will begin to allow us to fight the temptation to take advantage of God. This is where I want to make sure we, we end at this morning. Is that Paul ends with discussing this human argument. He says, by no means for then how could God judge the world? But if through my lie, God's truth abounds to his glory, why am I still being condemned as a sinner? And why not do evil that good may come? As some people slanderously charge us with saying, their condemnation, condemnation is just. If God is still righteous, regardless of our sin, then why do humans still stand condemned? Like if our actions don't change him, why should we then be condemned if he's just faithful? Why, why can't that just remove that the yoke from us? There's two sides of this coin. One, that God does provide a way for that to be removed from you through the Son. But there's also a side of it where because God has revealed himself, he does desire for us to actually respond in faith. And that God's faithfulness should lead us to faith, not a lynchous type of living. Here, and I, I want to talk about this because for some of us, we know that God is faithful. And because you know that he's faithful, you push the limits with God. Be because you know he's faithful and he's been there for you when you made a bunch of mistakes, you become very, very okay with just making the mistake. Well, God's grace is there for me. It, it, it covers a multitude of the sins, so I, I, I know that I'm good. And for some, that's been our own self-justification. It's been faithful, though, with reservation. Reservation because you, you think that there's something else better out there than just him. That you need to push the bounds just to make sure that you don't miss out on all that this life has to offer, even though God might tell you that this other path is good. comes back to doubt of authority, doubt of him being faithful. Because if he's faithful and you believe that, wouldn't you then trust him with the way that he's calling your life to be? Maybe you've been the person that believes that God is just going to be there for you regardless of whatever decision you make. And Paul wants you to remember, and he wanted the Romans to remember that God held Israel, Israel accountable and he will hold us accountable too. For some, you might be thinking right now, God, I've, I've held a lot back. There's been these certain areas that I have not really wanted to give up. 
there's been certain ideas that I haven't allowed to be taken captive by you. There's certain sin that I enjoy so much that I don't know if it's worth it because of your faithfulness. See, it's through this good news about Jesus and him coming, him living, dwelling among us that we have hope of our affections being changed. And for us to begin to respond in faith to God without reservation, it takes a heart change. I don't know why you're holding back. I don't know why some are pushing the limits right now. But God does want to grab a a hold of all of you. I don't know what you believe is, is more to gain right now. Maybe your faith is much more like one of the the bandwagon fans that I mentioned earlier. In the seasons when you feel like God is blessing you, you're all about them. But when the seasons where life is hard, you struggle with them. Friends, that's a sense of a prosperity gospel to your own self, really. That for God to be faithful, you must flourish. That when life is hard, Clearly, he hasn't been good or kind to you. That's far from the truth. See, part of the life of self-denial and and following Jesus is a life of taking up your cross. And when we talk about taking up your cross, it's you actually allowing the old person to be pinned to that cross, and you are humbling yourself and following after him. And in following him, it's following him in faith. And when you follow him in faith, that means that you might not understand what's around every corner. You might not know how God is going to use you or how he's going to work, even through tragedy or through strife or turmoil. But you know he's faithful. So wherever he leads you, you just want to go with him. And for some of us, we haven't come to that that point of faith in our lives. That if the, the room was dark and you couldn't see, You would rather find your own trust the voice of Jesus to guide you. Because he needs to prove his faithfulness to you before you'll listen to him. You need to see the success in other people's lives before you'll you'll live a life of radical faith. Fam, that's a consumeristic mentality when it comes to faithfulness. And it's the way that we operate in relationships all the time. But God wants more for you. See, Christ came and died so that even though your affection might have been far from him, that you could be changed in that affection, that he can reconcile you to himself. Another way of him showing to you his faithfulness. And for those who are listening right now and you're contemplating your faith and what it means to take next steps, begin there. Begin with the the triune God revealing himself to you, and he's done so in a very particular way through the Son. Yet my question for all of us today, and this is where I'm going to leave us at, is how will you respond? Will your response of a life of faith of following Jesus be one of faithfulness? Or will you take advantage of his faithfulness? Will you live a life that is faithlessness? Or will you humble yourself and learn and grow in a vision of for what it means to be faithful to God and his word. Let's pray with me. Father, we uh, come before you right now. Thankful for the shed blood of Jesus. Thankful for how he welcomes us into relationship with the Godhead, Lord, and we praise you for that. Thank you for your spirit. That even though some right now might feel like they're wandering, thinking through how maybe they've abused even their relationship with you. I pray that they would just be reminded of the grace that you established for us. I pray that you would help us to see the the depths of grace. I also pray that you you would help us to appreciate it. 
Father, I pray as well that as we've been given the oracles of God and we stand here as representatives of you, help us to, to take that as a privilege there, that like we have been, you've made yourself known to us and that we've responded or to the gospel and we, we have this good news and we have this deposit that has been entrusted to us, as your epistles say. we ask that you would help us figure out how to guard it, to be a faithful representative. Help us to be faithful without reservation today. I pray all this in Jesus' name.